There were once two acorns that sat high up in the tree. The older acorn was wishing to impart some wisdom on the younger one. He said, you know, you have greatness within you. Crammed inside your tiny shell is an oak tree yearning to come out. The younger one looks at the older one in astonishment and says, you're nuts. <laughs> the older one replies, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. I'm a nut and you're a nut. We are acorns and crammed within us is an oak tree yearning to spring forth. Look at the forest floor though. So many acorns fail to realize their full potential. They become lunch for squirrels. But if you can create the right conditions, you can become the majestic oak tree, the most glorious of all the trees in the forest. You can create that lasting legacy. I work as a hospice chaplain. Normally when I say I work for hospice, people take a few steps back. They don't know how to respond to that. This is largely because people think hospice is all about dying. Truly though, as hospice works with the dying, it teaches so much about living. What are some of the lessons that the dying can teach to the living? Leo Tolstoy wrote a classic short story called The Death of Ivan Illich. In it, he has Ivan reflecting on his conventional life as he lays dying. There, on his deathbed, he asked what, to my mind, would be a horrifying question. What if my whole life has been wrong? Americans were asked to rank what is most important to them. Included in the list is family, health, friends, work, money, religion, hobbies, leisure time, community activities. The surveys get similar findings even when repeated in different years. Americans consistently rank family and health as the most important aspects of life. Friends, work, money, religion are all viewed as less important and roughly equal. In the context of someone who is nearing the end of his or her life, I think that this says basically three things. One, money and possessions are usually not the most important things in life. Money does not buy happiness. At best, money may rent happiness, but if we have spent a lifetime collecting money and things, we come to see that ultimately this leaves us empty. Two, at the end of our lives, our work and profession are not as important. Work is an important part of life, but it does not define us in any ultimate sense. No one at the end of their life says, I wish I had worked more. And three, the opinions of others are not that important. The thoughts of others are so fleeting and fickle, worrying about the thoughts of others is wasted worry. If these things are not important at the end of life, what then is important? Most people at the end of their lives want to know that their lives mattered, that they made a difference, that the world is somehow different because they were here. They come to truly appreciate what is reflected in those surveys that the most important things are family, health, and legacy. Several years ago, I knew a hospice patient named Betty. Betty was a pleasant lady. One of the things that she would constantly tell me was that she was a proper Southern lady. She taught me that in the South, when we don't have something nice to say about someone, we simply say, bless his heart. She was such a storehouse of wisdom. However, from the first time I met Betty, I could tell that something bothered her. It took weeks to build rapport and gain her trust. She finally shared with me that when she was 16 years old, she had gotten pregnant. The baby was born and adopted out somewhere. She had no idea where the little girl went or what became of her. To make the matter a bit more complicated, Betty's husband of 50 years had no idea any of this had ever happened. Not knowing what had happened to her daughter and keeping this deep secret had taken a toll on Betty. She was full of fear. What if I tell my husband and he doesn't understand? 
What if he becomes angry and feels lied to? She feared putting a strain on their marriage in its twilight. Betty did come to terms with her past, and with a great deal of courage, she told her husband about this unknown daughter who would now be 53 years old. Her husband was amazing at this news. He was compassionate, understanding, and kind. Because this 50-year-old secret had been put to rest, they now had a closeness and an intimacy like never before. As difficult as it was for Betty to tell her husband, there was another piece to this that was even more challenging. All we knew was a birth date, time, location, and gender. Would it ever be possible to find this now 53-year-old woman? Technology is an amazing tool. With the help of a few telephone calls, the internet, and even a private investigator, we found her. She was living in another city and had been trying for years to find her birth mother. With her voice and hands trembling, Betty made a telephone call to the daughter she had not seen in 53 years. Her husband and I cried tears of joy as we watched Betty reconnect with her daughter. Two weeks after that call, the daughter was able to make the trip to meet Betty in person. This whole experience, losing the burden of a secret and reconnecting with family, made Betty an entirely different person. She was now complete and happy. Three months later, when she died, it happened beautifully and peacefully, surrounded by her old and newfound family. Betty was able to connect with family, and she did it with enough time to enjoy that connection for a few months before she died. Betty has left a lasting legacy with me. She reminds me, still, that family connection is important. For us, there is good news and bad news. The bad news is that each and every one of us is going to die one day. The good news is that there is still time. There is still time to recognize the importance to connect with family. Yes, family may be ultimately more important than work, but what about those times that work takes us away from family? There are creative ways to deal with this. For example, technology allows families to connect even when work takes them away. I've seen soldiers deployed halfway around the world that are still able to check their children's homework in real time. Amazing. Technology, though, also has the ability to hinder family connections. Let us be mindful of this. Put our phones down and actually talk to each other. The point here is not to feel guilty or beat ourselves up. The point is to recognize that family is important or likely will become so, and to work at improving our connection to family. Health is or likely will become a priority in our lives. We can make conscious choices here as well. Exercise more, eat right, get enough rest, drink more water. Nurture mental and emotional health, too. Take that vacation, read a good book, call an old friend, scratch a few things off a bucket list. Finally, we can make a difference and make the world a better place. We can do this one in countless ways, each and every day. Practice a random act of kindness, plant a tree, become an organ donor, smile more, laugh more, love more. Another patient we had was named Charlie. Charlie was an old Marine. He had served in World War II and Korea. Charlie was a hard man, a mean man. Actually, the best way to describe this cranky old man is to say, bless his heart. <laughs> Charlie had a tough outer shell, and no one would get into that shell. He was a man's man, and he raised his three sons to be the same. At Charlie's funeral, his oldest son, John, described to me what had happened just the week before. John was helping his father in the bathroom. He described how hard it was for his father, a proud Marine, to need help in the bathroom. As John lifted his father off of the toilet, this frail old man kissed his son on the cheek and said, I love you. John shared with me. For years, I had played sports, had broken bones, 
and even joined the military because I longed to hear and deserve those words from my father. This was the one and only time I ever heard my father say he loved me. And he says it now, one week before he dies, we wasted so much time. Yes, John was angry that his father waited all that time to say those words. But he was later able to appreciate that at least he has the memory of hearing his father say this. Many, many people do not have that memory. What are the memories we are creating with the lives that we lead? What are the legacies we wish to create to design with our lives? Do our current lives reflect the priorities that we are likely to have at the end of our lives? Let us strive to live so as to avoid Ivan Illich's hauntingly horrible question, what if my whole life has been wrong? Let us begin today to live each day more fully, more alive, with no regrets. Thank you.